A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter and John were going up to the temple area for the three o'clock hour of prayer. And a man crippled from birth was carried and placed at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate every day to beg for alms from the people who entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. But Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. He paid attention to them, expecting to, to receive something from them. Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, rise and walk. Then Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles grew strong. He leaped up, stood and walked around, and went into the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the one who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with amazement and astonishment at what had happened to him. Verbum Domini. Consider the Lord and his strength, constantly seek his face. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice. O children of Abraham, his servant, sons of the Jacob he chose. He, the Lord, is our God. His judgments prevail in all the covenant forever, his promises for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac.
Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Verbum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the Newman Center at the University of Toronto hangs a beautiful icon of the journey to Emmaus, crafted by Sister Mary Paul, a Benedictine sister of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Above the icon are the evocative words, were not our hearts gradually catching fire within us as he spoke to us on the road. Notably, this image depicts the journeying of them as a married couple. This says, according to the painter, that at the core of marriage, which is most people's vocation, many of you here, spiritual sharing is vital. And that in sharing every aspect of a person's life which marriage demands, Christ is truly present, though sometimes in a veiled manner. Recently, Pope Francis asked the crowd gathered in St. Peter's Square to pray for married couples who were in trouble. He then said something quite exquisite. 
Married couples are called to be icons, albeit imperfect images of God's love for those around them. He also noted that when they fight, and all couples do, tender words and gestures can reconcile them. The sacrament of marriage, he said, leads us to the heart of God's plan, which is a plan of covenant with his people and with all of us. Marriage must be considered a consecration, he said. The man and woman are consecrated for love. Through the sacrament, the spouses are given a real mission to make visible, even though through simple and ordinary gestures, the love with which Christ loves his church. We all know how many difficulties and trials spouses face. What is important is to keep alive a bond with God who is the foundation of the matrimonial bond, the Pope said. Marriages are stronger when husbands and wives pray for each other and with each other. There are always fights in a marriage, aren't there? He asked them. Plates sometimes fly. The secret, though, is that love is stronger than an argument. Don't end your day without making peace, the Pope argued. It's not necessary to call the United Nations and have them come to your house to broker the peace. A little gesture, a caress, can suffice. Pope Francis prescribed frequent use of three magic words. May I? Thank you. And sorry. With these words and with prayer and by making up before going to bed, your marriage will continue, the Pope said. Returning now to the journey to Emmaus, we know that all the disciples, that one of the disciples was named Cleopas. He could be that the Greek Cleopas represents the Hebrew Klopas, the husband of Mary, present at the crucifixion in St. John's account, chapter 1925. We ask ourselves, why isn't Cleopas' companion named? Maybe the second disciple was Cleopas' wife. Or maybe Luke left this disciple unnamed so that you, so that I might see, yourself, see ourselves in the story. As in the case with the marital interpretation, friends discover Christ to be present when they share spiritual thoughts. Jesus expressed this truth in the passage, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. A key feature of the narrative is the disciples' initial inability to identify Jesus. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Concealment, formulated in the passive voice, suggests that God was mysteriously at work preventing recognition until just the right moment. So God permitted a form of spiritual blindness to fall on the disciples to prepare them for a revelation of the risen Jesus. People discover Jesus through a fresh understanding of the prophecies of his resurrection. The dramatic concealment may also be a lesson for us we learn in it that we can know the presence of the risen Lord without seeing him. Indeed, Catholics experience this every week at the Sunday celebration of the Eucharist, or as we are doing today during the week. The stranger on the road joined the recent experiences that the Emmaus-bound travelers had of the Jesus movement with the scriptures that they already knew and had prayed and thought about. They described Jesus of Nazareth as a prophet mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people. They had suspected that Jesus might have been the Messiah. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Then came the great letdown. Our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. Even knowing that some disciples found the tomb empty and received an angelic message that morning, couldn't convince them that Jesus was alive. It seemed only to deepen the tragedy for them. Jesus shared an interpretation of the scriptures that showed suffering to be part of God's plan, part of God's plan for our lives as well. The first glimmers of hope stirred in their breasts. Was it not necessary, that is, was it not God's will that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was written about himself. As we read the scriptures, we learn what God has in mind for us, too. In today's other reading from the Acts of the Apostles, we see Peter and John give the joy of the gospel to a crippled beggar. 
He used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple, and the apostles healed him in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. In the next few days, as we follow the scripture readings in the daily lectionary, we will hear how the early church began to read the scriptures in the light of Christ's death and resurrection. This joyful news, in all its various manifestations, and its manifestations in our lives, will cause the hearts of us Christ disciples to burn within us. It will lead us, I believe, to become missionaries, proclaiming the good news to those around us, as the apostles did in Jerusalem. So let us, my dear friends, as we rejoice with those received into full communion with the church or were initiated through the sacraments at the Easter Vigil, let us continue to rejoice in the Easter mysteries as we recognize Christ present among us in the breaking of the bread at this Mass. Amen.